Well, thank you. Uh, hello, good afternoon, everybody. My name's Kevin Robinson. I'm uh, uh, Shoal's uh, chief engineer. Um, so today what I'm going to do is just give you a few insights on some of the do's and don'ts of introducing model-based systems engineering into your enterprise. And it sort of comes from a position of the lessons we've learned through in Shoal. Um, so just a quick introduction to who I am. Um, I'm a first-time attendee of, of the workshop, so thank you, the organizers. It's very great so far, and I expect the rest of the time to be great as well. Um, but I've been a long-term advocate of the working group, and I uh, established and chaired the model-based conceptual design working group some time ago. So normally at this point, I'm in my pajamas, and it's 1 o'clock in the morning, and I'm talking to an audience like this via telecom. So this is a unique experience for me. Um, so, but one of the products we produced out of the model-based conceptual design working group um, was a special edition of Insights. And, um, and I just wanted to pull this one quote out. There's a number of articles in there, but... Uh, Senator David Fawcett, who's one of our members of parliament in Australia, kindly did a keynote article for, for the edition. And uh, the, my quote, my favourite quote from the whole edi edition there is that uh, perhaps a few, perhaps fewer, sorry, lawyers and more engineers would make a parliamentary process more effective. And I guess that's what I'm trying to do here. I'm going to give you some tips about how model-based systems engineering can make your, um, introducing it, easier uh, and smoother and make, make your enterprise more effective. Um, so to find a bit more context, so Shoal has been introducing model-based systems engineering to a number of organizations and the like for more than 12 years now. Um, we've done it at many different levels. We've done it at the organizational level. We've done it at the project level. Um, we've done it at different points in the life cycle. Um, and we've done it on some of Australia's biggest acquisition programs. So this is C1000 we contributed to and helped the uh, Australian Navy uh, design that capability. Um, but also we've done it in transport, we've done it in, uh, in defence, as I say, and for industry and government. So we've got a broad range of experiences. And I guess what I'm going to do today is just run through a few tips for you of, of some of the things we learned along the way of how to be more successful introducing uh, model-based systems engineering into your organisation. So, I'll get straight into it. Uh, what you will notice with these slides, we were required not to put words and more pictures, so that's what I've been trying to do with these. So, uh, hopefully you'll get entertained by the pictures. Um, the first do, as I've put up there, and I think this is a really important one, which is why it's number one, the rest aren't really prioritised, is you need to find a champion in your organisation. So, who in your organisation is going to fight for your cause internally? And what I don't mean just resources or funding. What I mean is, is that leadership role in an organisation uh, where, where they can articulate the why, they can articulate the vision, they can articulate the purpose of bringing model-based systems engineering into that organisation and can follow it up and follow the programme and, and um, you know, empower their employees to, to get on and deliver that. Um, and so you need this one individual in an organization is willing to champion it. They don't necessarily have to be in charge of engineering. It could be one another leader in the organization. And what's an extra little bit to that as well is that individual who's become your champion in, in bringing model-based systems engineering into your organization. If that champion has a pet project, make sure that's the first project you do MBSC on because you'll have even more greater chances of success. Um, the next do, uh, the earlier the better. Surely we all know that, um, but unfortunately we in Shoal and a number of other organisations I'm aware of see this time again where we get brought in, you know, a year after a project has started to try and introduce model-based systems engineering onto that programme. So it sort of goes without saying, earlier the better, but not always the case. And I was on a project recently where um, we were sitting in a meeting and, and this, our clients at the time, we'd been through a number of sort of uh, presentations of what we're doing with our modelling, uh, and, a, and a client at the time <laughs> turns to us and said, geez, I wish you guys were here a year ago. And it's so true, because what you're doing is you've got these documents that are your source of information at that point, and you're retrofitting them into a model. Now, you can do that, and you can get on and do that. Um, but what we've found is by doing that, you obviously find issues, risks, little insights that weren't picked up in the document-based approach. And, and it's too late the design that has been made or the decision has been made on that previous information and so it's too late. So it, it introduces rework, which is a good thing. You, you know, you're sorting these problems out, but the earlier the better, you, the more chance of success that you have in introducing model-based systems engineering. So this one, the minimal viable model. What do I mean by, what do I mean by that? Um, 
And for me, it's around fidelity or the level of detail you need to go to in your modeling. Um, I guess, you know, but you need to be clear about that up front. If you can define what that level of fidelity needs to be to answer your analytical questions on the challenges you're having with the project, um, define it up front. I mean, I, I guess we're all engineers, and like me, you're probably like me, the, where you need to, where you like to refine the detail and, and do more modeling if you can. And just because you can doesn't mean to say you should. So, so to set yourself up for success, what I'd advise is to try and define the level of fidelity you want to go to and get to that point and stop the modeling. You've then delivered a product that you can pass to your client and help them on that, on that journey. But if you can define that fidelity up front, do it. And that will help you with the success. <clears throat> and sort of aligned to that is avoid, avoid scope creep. Um, seen this on, on a number of um, projects where we've tried to introduce, well, we have introduced model-based systems engineering. And I remember one particular project where we had a, a senior uh, project leader, uh, and when I say senior, both in, both in experience and position in the company, um, and they, weren't, they hadn't quite grasped what model-based systems engineering was and how it was uh, introduced, how it was going to add value to their program. Um, but when this individual got it, he really got it. And it was a bit of a worry because he, he, we presented a number of, or the organizations that had presented a number of times this particular project that we were introducing it on, presented the results of this model-based systems engineering, and he sort of nodded and, and trusted his uh, engineers, and they were all excited about it. Um, but I remember one particular meeting where it, you sort of saw the light bulb go off on the top of his head, and all of a sudden he, he, you could see that he got it, and he'd really got it. And what he did immediately after realizing that, he sort of said, oh, how damn good is this? And then he started to ask questions. Oh, what if we could do this? How about that? Can we do this? And all of a sudden the scope creep came right out, and he wanted to expand the use of the model, and it, and it would have caused us a huge headache. So what I would advise is if you can avoid that scope creep by defining again up front what the specific purpose of your modeling environment is and stick to that and deliver against that and then you have a greater chance of success. But go back later and, uh, and ask what else can we can do with that model. But make sure you've got that delivery of success. So there's four do's for you. What I wanted to do is now change it around and think about things don't do. So don't forget, the first one is don't forget it's, a, it's about an organizational capability. I, I spoke about it earlier with, you know, finding a champion in an organization. But an organization capability is around the people, the processes, the information, uh, the culture, the governance, whatever capability definition you have. Um, but really it's about us engineers. We're the ones that are on the coalface who, and we're the ones actually introducing that model-based systems engineering. So you've got to deal with those people issues and those, and those systematic behaviors or culture that exist in the teams in the organization. So it's a real people focus. And so what I advise is to focus on those individuals and how you can make a change in their life. And, and if you look into the change management literature, what you need to find is the right group of, group of people that are those early adopters. Find a project, not necessarily the project that's going to see, but find a project that contains those early adopters, if you can do through sort of interviews and the like. And find that project, you're going to have a greater chance of success of introducing model-based systems engineering. So those early adopters will grab it with open arms and pull it in. And once you've done that, you can then, you will then deliver outcomes into the organization and start to see it. And those, as the change management community would call it, those late majority can then see what's happening and what's being delivered. And then you get greater chance of that adoption happening. So find that project with those early adopters would be our advice. <clears throat> so, here's an interesting one for me. Don't rely on the modelers for a shared understanding. Now, we've just, even for me, I say it's a uh, current and common understanding of, of, of the problem at hand, the solution at hand, whatever the model is representation, representing. You know, and it's a rich source of information. But what I really mean by that is that when you're introducing model-based systems engineering into an organization, it's not just about that project. It's not just about those engineers and that project team. It's about a broader organization. There's a broader set of stakeholders around that, that project team that's using the model-based systems engineering. And, uh, and what we found, and I remember one example where, uh, again, it was another senior leader, and I wasn't quite grasping what was going on. And, and we sort of picked up this with, with time. And, and what we ended up doing was showing, trying to display the model in different ways and formats to this individual to try and communicate what the model was actually achieving. And it wasn't until we introduced a functional flow block diagram 
that he really got it. Uh, and it was at that moment you saw the twinkle in the eye, and he was committed from that point onwards. So what I would encourage you to do, I mean, people like that that are on the fringes of the projects don't have time to learn some of the modeling techniques or some of the modeling languages, you know. They, they, they just need to see it very intuitively into, into, their, you know, into their perception. So I'd, what I encourage you to do for a success is to try and think about it from their perspective and engage that broader section of the cross-section of the organization in a way that they will want to see it. Maybe, for example, if it's, the, if it's you know, the finance people, maybe they want to see some sort of Gantt chart format. But I'd encourage you to be adaptable and think how you might want to display this through to uh, the rest of the organization. So, <laughs> sorry, Dan. <laughs> we are, uh, in a, a, don't ignore the documents. We are in a document-centric world. I mean, I guess I, I, I put this up because what we've found is, you know, you, Changing an organization, you've got to do it one bite at a time, as they say when you're eating an elephant. But, um, you know, we are in a document-centric world. Organizations have their processes in place, and they, you know, they uh, approve artifacts by signing off on them, uh, and it tends to be in a, in a document format. Um, people also enjoy reading documents. Um, so if you can... <laughs> so, okay, I'll rephrase that. Some people... <laughs> um, if you can... And this is what we've had success with, is to extract the documents straight from the model. Don't add any extra information, just to make it as easy as you can to pull it from the model. And include the information that you might want to add to the document within the modeling environment. So produce the document from the model. Because um, you do have to operate that. So you're not changing the bigger process here, the diamond <laughs> for 2020. You're not changing that bigger process. The artifacts are still produced in whatever the senior leaders or the authority people, authoritative personnel have. I've seen them in the past. Just change the model based on what the engineers are doing themselves. So change that bit first, and then change the document-based approach at a later date. And in addition to that, what we've found is that it's quite good to hand an individual a document, because they will go through, and they're more, particularly the people who approve these artifacts, so they're more in tune with... Uh, writing reviewer comments through a document that they would be actually working directly into the model. And so what we found is it's like an extra validation point on your model because it's a representation of the model. So they're sort of working through what you've done in your modeling world anyway. So we find that it's still very useful, but I would encourage you to think about it. And it's, a, it's very much dependent on the organization. Each organization has its different approaches, but I guess some of the ones we've seen are, are, are in that. So, um, and then the final don't. <laughs> Don't think it's quicker. Um, in the early days of helping some organizations transition across, we did some analysis to, to look at how long it would take to write a document and produce it in an unstructured way, I guess, uh, in an open way, versus a model-based systems engineering way. And what we found was it was taking about the same length of time. But what we obviously also found was the model-based systems engineering approach was giving a much uh, more robust, uh, better quality products out of it. Um, and so it was about the same time. And also what we also... What we also found, sorry, was that in a model-based systems engineering approach, you had a, a greater hump at the beginning. You took you a little bit of extra effort early on to structure that model and bring it together. And that tailed off with time, whereas a document-based approach tend to be very consistent in the effort. So when you're trying to sell your model-based systems engineering into your organization, I'd advise you don't say it's quicker. Just go down the fact that it's a better approach. Um, so finally, just to kind of wrap up here, I guess, um, just to conclude a few things. I I've talked through some do's and some don'ts. Um, you know, across the top there, you know, find that champion who can sell your cause for the change in your organization and get into the projects as early as possible, trying to reduce that sort of retrofitting of information into a modeling environment. And then think about what that modeling is actually going to do to you, not only in, uh, do to you, do to you for your organization, not only in terms of the scope, the purpose of that model, but also the level of fidelity you need in that model uh, to defy, to produce the outcomes for your organization at that point in time on your pilot project. And if you can define that up front and be successful in that, then you can move on from that point onwards. And then going across the bottom there, you know, you've got to think about this as an organizational capability and how individuals are changing because of that. Um, but it's in that first sort of introduction of model-based systems engineering, it's not just about the engineers, it's also about that broader stakeholder in your broader stakeholders in your organization. So think about that and how, how you can help them understand what you're trying to change in your organization. And then the two final ones there, we are 
in a lot of organizations we've been into, they are, still have their document-centric approach. So try and keep that in place and just do one change at, a chi change at a time. In other words, you change in their approach to engineering and don't think it's quicker. Don't set yourself up for failure. Sell it as a quality product and reducing risk and reducing rework. And so with that, and three minutes to spare, I'm done. So thank you, everybody. <laughs>